Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth in our series um, of heat source webinars entitled Heat in the Highlands and Islands. Um, today's session focuses on our island communities. Um, and we're delighted to have, um, after myself, four speakers coming up. Uh, we've got Keith Masson from Highlands Islands Enterprise, Peter Rodriguez from Energy Saving Trust, Craig Harriet from Flexel, and Johnny Ingledew from North Hughes Distillery. Um, we'll run one speaker to the next, um, and then at the end we'll have time for a Q&A. Um, so if you do have questions, please post them in the in the webinar chat function, um, and we'll come to them all at the end. My name's Tom Warren. Um, I work with Built Environment Smarter Transformation, or BEST, and I'm going to be your host this morning. So I'm going to briefly uh, tell you a little bit about heat source. Um, forgive me, those who've been us have been with us on previous webinars will have will have seen some of this already. Uh, but if you're new to heat source, uh, welcome. Heat source um, is a clean heat uh, support program uh, being delivered and funded by all three enterprise agencies in Scotland: so Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and South of Scotland Enterprise. Um, HeatSource Mission is a collaborative knowledge hub, um, an accelerator program for the industry sector. Um, importantly, it's technology agnostic, um, so this includes um, heat pumps in, in the various forms, um, we'll hear more of in due course, um, heat networks, district heating, um, heat from, from waste and other industrial processes, and direct electric heating. Um, as well as sort of all parts of the supply chain, manufacturers, installers, um, etc. Some of whom we're going to hear from today. Um, heat source, um, again, uh, if, you, if you're not aware, um, it's uh, well, Pan Scotland, as I've mentioned, um, but we provide them in dissemination of best practice um, in clean heat in Scotland um, through our monthly newsletter, um, uh, case studies on the website. Um, and other information um, via social media. Um, if you've not already signed up to our newsletter, um, you can do this uh, via the Heat Source website. Uh, there's a newsletter button there, and do follow us on social media um, and check out other information on the website. Um, you can also get in touch with us directly via the website, um, particularly if you've not engaged with the programme and like to have an initial one-to-one -one conversation. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Keith. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm really very grateful to, to HeatSource for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Uh, and I'm really here to, to set the scene for today's webinar, which is focusing on how we can use data to deliver more clean heat across our islands. Uh, and before we hear from our panel of industry experts, um, just in terms of context, back in 2023, um, HIE recognised the need to develop a more robust assessment of regional emissions uh, to inform our new strategy, but also to ensure that our work with partners was more targeted, um, as well as to focus on the clear areas of need around emissions reduction. So we commissioned Ecosgen to baseline the greenhouse gas emissions for the whole Highlands and Islands region, uh, for its constituent local authority areas, uh, as well as the carbon sequestration and renewable energy potential um, that is uh, presenting in front of us uh, right across the region. And I'm now going to very briefly summarise uh, the research from a heat perspective. Next slide, please, Tom. So it, it barely needs stating, um, but heat's an issue that affects us all, and it's one of the key regional challenges, as well as the opportunities of the coming decades. And the inescapable conclusion from our research is that reducing the emissions that we generate from running our homes and businesses is going to be much more of a challenge for the Highlands and Islands than for the rest of Scotland overall. And the overriding message from our analysis is that much of the region's footprint arises from a dependency on carbon intensive fossil fuels, particularly for heat, um, but also in industrial and uh, commercial manufacturing processes. And in many of our areas, the remoteness from on-grid energy supply and the quality in the age of our buildings, um, whether commercial premises or residential dwellings, is a major factor in energy consumption and thus our emissions profile. And for our residential dwellings in particular, energy efficiency, insulation and transition to low carbon means of heating and lighting is a critical area of focus and a huge opportunity for our business base going forward, given the relatively smaller proportion of our properties who have installed these measures to date. However, 
on a positive note, you know, this is really a largely untapped economic opportunity. And to me, our analysis, uh, coupled with aggregated up household data at a place-based level, starts to paint a really strong picture of the opportunity around clean heat and retrofit in the islands. And we need to provide confidence to current installers and potential new entrants to the market that there really is a credible and largely untapped 15 to 20 year pipeline of work just waiting to be realised here. Next slide, please, Tom. It will come as no surprise to anyone on the call today that we do have a high proportion of older dwellings in the Highlands and Islands, uh, with around 21% of our dwellings uh, being pre-19 build compared to 18% nationally. And these dwellings might be the least suited to current retrofitting processes or at the very least require more expensive interventions. Next slide, please, Tom. So this slide shows the main fuel type uh, by subregion in the Highlands and Islands. And you'll note that the reliance on high carbon fuel sources like heating oil and solid fuels really presents a fairly acute issue for us in terms of both domestic carbon emissions, but particularly given the high proportion of dwellings in, in island, remote rural and accessible rural, rural areas that rely on those types of fuels as their main fuel type. And that's further exacerbated when we consider that around a fifth of our dwellings um, use such fuels as their secondary fuel type as well. So just to try and summarise briefly what the research is telling us in terms of heat, it's important to reflect on the fact that emissions from residential properties are considerably higher per dwelling than elsewhere in Scotland, with mean emissions per dwelling being about six tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent in the Highlands and Islands against a figure of 4.3 tonnes elsewhere in Scotland. So just very finally for me, um, and I would hope many of you will agree, Net zero isn't going to happen if we continue on the current trajectory of attempting to address it as individual organisations, businesses or householders. It's going to need a lot more sophistication, better coordination and aggregation of data to inform more place-based approaches. And to that end, I'm really looking forward to hearing from our speakers this morning, to hearing from you on the call today in terms of your questions and ideas uh, around what we all see as the expected role of both the public and private sectors to maximise um, our ability to decarbonise heat over the coming years. So on that note, I'll now pass over to Pilar Rodriguez from EST. Thanks, Pilar. Thanks, Keith. Good morning. Good morning, all. Uh, I would like to start by uh, thanks, uh, thanking Tom from Heat Source and Keith from Highlands and Islands Enterprise to invite me here today. Um, I work for Energy Saving Trust. Uh, we are an independent organization working to address the climate emergency. I manage a program called the Green Heat Installer Engagement Program, and this is uh, funded by the Scottish Government to support businesses working in the clean heat supply chain with focus on those doing the actual installations. Today, however, I'll be also presenting on a board broader support, on the broader support uh, that is available for businesses, householders, and communities um, living and working in the Scottish uh, Islands. Next slide, please. This is data that I took from the MCS um, Low Carbon Landscapes. Before uh, going into the data, for the benefit of the audience, um, MCS is a standard, a standards organization and a mark of quality. They create and maintain a standards that allows for the certification of low carbon products, installers and their installations, which are used to produce electricity and heat from renewable sources. So you can see on the slides, uh, three uh, graphs. Uh, showing MCS certified heat pumps uh, over time from 2010 to 2023. In uh, Orkney, there are a total of uh, 1,373 MCS uh, certified heat pumps uh, installations for heat pumps, which represent 14.76% uh, of uh, the households. This is quite a um, uh, good um, percentage compared with the average in Scotland. And they have, a, at the moment, four MCS certified contractors for the installation of heat pumps. In the Western Islands, and I do apologize to the Western Islands audience for using the all English name, but my attempts to pronounce the Gaelic name uh, have not been very successful. So I thought to keep safe. Um, so there are 2,650 MCS installations, 
which represent 20.54% uh, of households. This is the highest proportion across Scotland, um, and they have four MCS certified contractors. In Shetland, there are 913 MCS heat pumps installations in total, which represents 8.70% uh, uh, of the households living there, and there are seven MCS certified contractors that uh, can install heat pumps. Just to remind that for new build, uh, MCS is not a requirement, but MCS it is a requirement for accessing all their funding schemes that I will talk later on. So uh, what I mean with this is the number of heat pump installations could be higher um, than the numbers that are here. Next slide, please. I want to touch in the next slide on the support available to install uh, clean heat technologies uh, in the islands, uh, and that is for business. So Business Energy Scotland is a program funded by the Scottish Government and managed by Energy Saving Trust. It provides uh, expert and impartial advice to small, medium enterprises so they can save energy, money, and grow a greener business. There is an interest-free loan available up to £100,000 to help uh, those SMEs with the upfront cost. And also the loan can be combined with a grant up to £30,000. Next slide, please. This is a case study of a print business making right energy efficiency choices when moving into new premises. The business uh, moved into a former church which it was converted into an energy uh, efficiency offices with the professional support of Business Energy Scotland. The, bu the building is now hosting uh, other local businesses and the chair's uh, house is now a purpose created home of a Stornaway Media Centre. Next slide. We also have Home Energy Scotland that provides a one-stop shop for clear Free, free and impartial energy advice and support to householders to save energy, reduce uh, fuel bills, keep homes warmer and reduce carbon emissions. They can access, householders can access uh, funding in the form of an interest free loan and grants up to uh, 9,000 uh, for a heat pump, um, heat pump uh, installations. One of the conditions to access, as I mentioned, the funding is the MCS certification. So, yes, you can move to the next slide. This is just a this is a case study of a property in uh, Kirwall. Uh, with the support of Home Energy Scotland, um, the property installed loft insulation and double glazing initially. And a few years later, the owner contacted us back and was able to access the area-based scheme programs and got external wall insulation for her home, which made the home much warmer. This is just one of the samples, uh, but in the next slide, you will see that we have a, the Green Home Network and the Green Network for Business that those are um, web pages that uh, contains uh, hundreds of case studies of businesses and householders that have installed clean heat on, on their properties. Um, and many of them are based in the Scottish Islands, so you can have a, a look at, on your own uh, time. These networks are also a great platform uh, for installers to promote their customer installations on energy efficiency and renewable technologies. So if there are any installers on the audience, please do get in touch with us um, and we can get your uh, customers um, showcase in these networks. Next slide, please. A local Energy Scotland is also funded by the Scottish Government and managed by Energy Saving Trust. Um, and Local Energy Scotland Manage CARES, the Scottish Government's Community and Renewable Energy Scheme. CARE supports a wide range of projects, including installing renewable technologies in community buildings, community benefits, and share ownership. On the next slide, you're going to see an example. Um, the 
Outer Hebrides Local Energy Hub is a great example of the circular economy's approach to local energy. The project aimed to use uh, fish waste from the local food processing plant, fit this into an anaerobic digester, use the resulting biogas in a CHP uh, unit, combine the output power with energy from a local turbine to power a hydrogen electrolyzer, use the resulting oxygen to feed salmon and the hydrogen to power a fuel cell um, combined heating power, which provides heat and power to the salmon uh, hatchery. Finally, the hatchery then adds waste to the, the original fish waste and the cycle continues. The project won the Partnership Scotland Award from the uh, Scottish Environmental Business Awards in 2019. And this project was supported by Local Energy Scotland through the Scottish Government Local Energy Challenge Fund and received over £600,000 of funding. So it gives you the, uh, an idea of the variety of um, projects that are actually funding through Local Energy Scotland. And if you access their website, you will see many other cases. Uh, next slide, please. So one quick key thing, obviously, is uh, to be able to roll out uh, low carbon um, heating technologies. Uh, we do need to have a supply chain that is capable of delivering uh, those technologies. Um, and that's one of the challenges, as we know, to build uh, installers and supply chain in, in remote areas, particularly in the islands. Uh, of, of Scotland. So um, as I managed at the start, I, ma I managed the Green Heat Installer Engagement Programme, which is funded by the Scottish Government to support installers. And we have developed a toolkit to support heating engineers working currently on combustion boilers to transition into heat pumps. It provides the journey, the installer journey that needs to they need to follow to upskill and achieve MCS certification we have also developed a similar tool for the energy efficiency sector. Next, please. We also develop a, the Mobile Heat Pump Training Centre in partnership with, a, with funding from the Scottish Government and in partnership with Energy Skills Partnership and South Lanarkshire College and the, the Heat Pump Manufacturer, NIBE. We develop this mobile training unit because we were uh, uh, aware of the challenge for heating engineers to get up a scale on heat pumps in more rural and remote areas. And um, I'm very glad to say that uh, back in April, the van was uh, in Shetland and trained eight, uh, eight uh, heating engineers. So they have now uh, their qualification, the BPEC qualification on heat pumps. I'm glad to also announce that it's going back to Shetland again uh, around the, I think it's the week of the 21st of October, and it's going to train around 17 people this time. We uh, contacted Shetland a Construction Hub, and we are delighted that we are going to be able to, to support the, the local people there again with the, with the van. Next slide, please. We also have a funding from the Scottish Government to help installers, heating engineers that wants to um, achieve MCS, MCS certification on heat pumps. So we pay 75% um, of the cost up to a maximum of £1,000 uh, of the fees they need to pay to become MCS certified. Next, please. Energy 7 Plus also manages uh, the end Renewables Installer Finder tool. This is a, in collaboration with MCS. So every time that there is a new MCS um, installer uh, registered for any of any renewable technology, we contact them to see if they want to be part of the Renewables Installer Finder. This is the tool that we uh, refer householders that has been advised through Home Energy Scotland and Business Energy Scotland. We refer then to this tool to find an installer, IMC, a certified installer in Scotland. And this is a, 
it helps householders to narrow down the the search and also customers can leave a review um on the installer and it's a very for installers it's a very good marketing tool because it's free for them to be there and helps them to promote the services next please this is the last slide for me uh, for me just to say if um, you are not registered to our newsletter uh, please do so. We have also a LinkedIn group and uh, we have there our generic email address and the uh, web pages where we have further support for installers. So my last slide, thank you so much for listening and I'll pass you over Craig Harriot from Flexel. Thank you very much, Peeler. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Craig Herriot. I work for Flexel International, who are the infrared manufacturers in the UK. Uh, thanks to Tom and HeatSource for giving me the opportunity to speak today and to give you a very brief introduction to what we do at our factory in Glen Rothes. So you'll see we're obviously a member of Select Association and also uh, uh, Heat Source's um, champions for infrared heating as well as the newly formed members of the Smart Direct Electric Heating Forum, which I'm sure you'll all hear more about going forward. Um, just a bit of history about the company. Flexel was formed in 1978. That makes us 46 years old, so we really are the grandfathers of infrared heating in Europe. Um, we formed on the back of a product that we manufactured using an ink-based solution which is our unique selling point. That ink, when charged, dried off and charged, creates uh, far infrared energy waves, which are the key heating element for our products. The second factory, which we now own, uh, is in the Czech Republic. Uh, and in 2003, the owners of the Czech Republic factory, Fenex, bought us out. So we're now part of a much larger European group, which has 10 companies under it, but with two manufacturing uh, facilities. Within the group, we export, we export to over 70 countries worldwide, giving us a huge uh, coverage. And in the UK in particular, uh, things are now starting to move for us in terms of we're moving away from gas, as we all know. Uh, we have a 100,000 square foot factory, which is future proof for expansion, with more manufacturing coming into the UK, uh, particularly with the onslaught of removing of gas. Um, sales that currently are about 50-50 today for infrared versus underfloor heating, whereas five years ago that was 90% was underfloor heating and only 10% was infrared. So there's a huge shift towards far infrared technology. We work with domestic, industrial and commercial solutions, providing a, an overall blanket for all types of far infrared heating. And we have multiple control options available. Next slide, please, Tom. So these are our core products and a few pictures of them. So you'll see we have internal heating solutions and external heating solutions. Uh, the internal are based around um, underfloor heating solutions, as well as uh, far infrared. And we actually manufacture mirror demister pads, uh, which is a brand name on their own. Um, as for the external solutions, we do snow and ice prevention uh, kits in the form of mats. We also have a loose cable for underfloor heat, uh, and external heating for driveways, etc. And uh, the most popular product is our frost pipe protection cables and self regulating frost pipe protection cables as well. We have two um, main underfloor heating options, and we currently have 11 main far infrared products, plus a few other options in there as well from the products we manufacture at Glen Office. Next slide, please. Um, one of the main products we do is uh, electric underfloor heating cables, which come in a variety of options. Uh, these are resistance cables, which are all extruded in-house, so we have full control over the, the, the whole process. Uh, these are fixed wattage per square meter for each particular product. Therefore, it's very simple to work out what your energy use will be per hour per room. Uh, these warm the floor and create a convection heating from the floor upwards. As you know, hot air rises, and this type of heating generally creates convection heating, although there's some small element of radiant heating within that. Next slide, please. 
far infrared heaters is, mm -hmm. is by far where the market is today. Um, we, uh, all our panel elements are manufactured in Glenorthis with our specialist ink. This ink is mixed up to a variety of different uh, constituents uh, and basically is, is in, uh, in pr printed onto the cloth fibre cloth, cloth fiber element, which is used in all our panel heaters. This element doesn't leave the factory unless it's in a dry state, and that protects the secret formula for it. Um, so within Europe, we're the only company that can manufacture this. Other companies will use a resistance cable within their infrared panel heaters, which is much less efficient than our product. And our product compared to a cable product from the Far East or, or indeed in Europe, it can be up to 50% more efficient. So infrared heating basically warms people first and the air second, as opposed to all other type of direct electric heating, which heats the air first, and that then heats people. Infrared heating works the same way as the sun does. If you're outside on a cold day and you can see the sun through the clouds, then you will start to feel the heat from that, which is radiant heating, which is far infrared heating hitting you. Although you know the air round about you is particularly cold, and that's how infrared works. Next slide, please. Far infrared film. Um, basically, the first product we produced was the product on the right hand side of the screen there. And this was produced um, basically by mixing chemicals together and creating a far infrared ceiling heating element. Today, there are a couple of companies that produce similar products, but our element is floating because the plasterboard goes on top of it rather than embedded into it. Uh, it allows for expansion and contraction, so it's not connected directly to the plasterboard. This was very successful in the 70s and the early 80s until, of course, we discovered gas in the North Sea and that became the favoured option. But today, even still, this is uh, by far a, a very good exported product for us. And we're hoping that as things change with the new regulations and moving towards direct electric heating, that we might see some of this product specified in new build houses. The picture on the left is actually our second underflow heating solution which is far infrared underflow heating. This basically heats the surface of the floor, but also penetrates through in the same way that uh, infrared panels do, uh, and uh, generates uh, infrared waves that bounce around the room and heat the objects they come into contact with. The result of the far infrared heating is that it heats the thermal mass of the room up. So therefore, when the temperature does drop, i.e. if a window or doors open and all the air rushes in, the cold air comes in, the hot air is rushed out, the temperature will drop in the room, but then when the doors or windows are closed, everything in the room is becoming a radiator itself and generating heat to heat the air in the room, therefore bringing the temperature up much quicker. Next slide, please. So really, that's, <laughs> that's kind of a very quick rendition of what we do. As I said, we have two factories uh, in the, in the, uh, within Europe which manufacture all of the products and solutions. The key element for us is the infrared uh, films and uh, infrared underflow heating elements, which also are manufactured into demister pads, PET cassettes, uh, and also the snake and reptile heating. So we have a, a large variety of options there. We do have a factory and a showroom, and we're happy to show it off. We also do all the design work for you as well. So if you have drawings and uh, uh, room plans or building drawings, uh, please send them to me and we can get a design done for you to give you an indication of the kilowatts required for that and also for the, uh, the costing for that to give you an indication on that. So any questions, please type them in now for, for myself. If you would like a meeting at the factory or a tour, email me. And uh, also we're looking to get our solutions specified as much as possible, particularly with our efficient and effective far infrared heating solutions. Any questions, feel free to call me after the meeting. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to introduce you now to Johnny. Johnny's going to talk about North Uist Distillery. Thanks, Johnny. Brilliant. Thanks, Greg. And um, I didn't actually know what your uh, business um, provided until I just watched those slides. I'm quite a good case study for you. Our entire business is heated through um, electric uh, infrared panels. and. We've been using them for about four years now, and they're brilliant to use them across multiple sites. And they're great for kind of big spaces, just a, a bit more of an efficient way to heat a space in a low carbon fashion. So I'm a big, big fan for sure. 
Um, next slide, please. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Johnny. Um, Madden Va is Mr. Johnny, uh, as we'd say in our native tongue in the Hebrides. I'm a native Hebridean, as is my co-founder, Kate, that's in this photo with me, both squeezing into this small window. And um, we um, followed the typical school leaver journey as native Hebrideans of leaving the island for further education. People leave for multiple reasons, but generally a lot of people do tend to leave the islands at some point. And we were um, lucky that we both wanted to move back home and could. And um, I retrained and did a degree in bringing distilling and worked in breweries and distilleries around the UK uh, before we moved back home in 2017 to start North US Distillery. And it's been a really positive move for us. Um, we love being back here and it's an amazing place to kind of uh, raise a family and just kind of live in general. So um, yeah, a, a great experience for us. And our aim since launching the uh, business has been to create a field to bottle a carbon neutral whiskey distillery, whilst also being the best employer on the islands. And that's like our guiding star and what really um, guides us in our business decisions and everything to do with the business. So uh, that's our kind of mission statement. Next slide, please. And um, just going on to that, we're a B Corp certified bus uh, business is about uh, something like 50 to 60 B Corps in Scotland. So not that many yet. I think it represents something like 0.02% of businesses in Scotland that are B Corps. And the concept of a B Corp is really about balancing uh, people, which can be your community, uh, your team uh, with the planet, your environmental footprint uh, against profit. So we're not purely just making our decisions on profitability for the business. That does, of course, come into it, but we've also got to weigh up um, how it affects our team, our community and the planet as well. So that's actually written into our articles of association as a business. So. Uh, you've got to do that to become a B Corp, really kind of pledge that um, you're going to really take this seriously. So uh, we got B Corp certified in um, about a year and a half ago now. And um, for the last six years, we've been running a carbon neutral gin distillery um, and we produce a range of gins. We've always distilled in a house called Danpour Gin. They're pretty successful. They're exported to something like uh, 10 or 11 international markets and um, we've got a team of about 14 of us now in the business um, and yeah, it's, um, uh, yeah, that's kind of been the uh, vehicle with which we've been able to do a little bit of fundraising and raise some money and pay for our whiskey plans, which we're just moving into at the moment. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our lovely um, visitor center on a nice bluebird kind of day. Um, which is always like this in the Outer Hebrides, <laughs> 365 days of sunshine. Um, it's 300 year old building, it's uh, grade B listed, so we need a listed building consent if we're going to do anything to it. So it can be quite restrictive working with a building like this, but you know, the kind of character that the building lends is, it is there, you know, it's a beautiful building and aesthetically you can't really build a building like these, like this these days, it's just too expensive really. So we love being in here. Um, but it does present certain challenges. Um, retrofitting any kind of technology into it gets very, very expensive. You know, the kind of uh, energy efficiency of the building uh, isn't always there, um, but there's technologies that help with that, certainly. And I talked about um, infrared heating, actually, which is um, what we've got in uh, our uh, Nunton Steadings. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, yeah, this is just the layout, internal layout of the building. So we've got our... Um, production, um, our whiskey equipment, our production equipment's all in the kind of um, uh, top right hand side, going through to our tasting room where we've got a shop, uh, a bar and a small tasting room. We get about 15,000 people coming to our visitor centre each summer. So US has got a relatively small um, uh, visitor numbers. I think there's something like 40 to 45,000 people come through, uh, visit US each year. So. And we actually get quite a lot of footfall through the visitor center proportionally to that. And then we've also got our cask storage here as well. So we sold some casks in advance um, to help fund the whiskey equipment. Establishing a whiskey distillery is a bit of a crazy business model. It requires huge upfront capital. Um, you need to approach it with scale just because um, there's no point waiting for several, several years for your whiskey to mature if you don't have an awful lot to sell. So the equipment's expensive and you need to buy a lot of it. And then you've got this um, period where you're laying down stock um, where you can't sell it. So 
until you can sell it until it's three year, a minimum of three years old. So you've got this kind of maturation lag time where you've got the cost of laying down stock, but you're not able to uh, realize or achieve the kind of uh, value of that. Um, so the way some distilleries get around that is by um, selling casks in advance, which is uh, what we've done here and what we'll be laying down here. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> and this is just um, a kind of 3D render of uh, the production size side of the building. Um, so we've got our hot end of our building, our stills, um, going through to the kind of cold end of the uh, production equipment. We've got our uh, mash tun and our uh, wooden uh, washbacks. And then going around the back of the building, it was quite a small building. Uh, we had whiskey plans already in place, and then this building um, was put up for sale about four or five years ago when we bought it. So we had to really kind of retrofit all our equipment into this space, our, our, the plans for our whiskey equipment. So we've put some of the equipment outside as well. We've got a water buffer tank. Um, we've got uh, built a shed out back where we've got an electric steam boiler. So we're an electrically powered distillery. And then we've also got um, an air cooling tower where we um, uh, cool down our cooling water that uh, cools the condensate coming off the stills. And that goes around a, a closed circulatory loop and basically reduces our water consumption by a significant order, order of magnitude. Um, and then we've also got just off to the side of this that you can't see, we've got this huge substation on site. So we had to put in um, three phase, a very, very big three phase connection to the site. Um, five, well, 800 kilovolt substation, and we use 500 kilovolts on site at peak demand. So the extremely high um, energy demand just because we're fully electric. We're the only whiskey distillery in Scotland that's fully electric like this. Um, so we've actually got pretty much the biggest electrical connection of any whiskey distillery in Scotland, although we're also the, one of the smallest. Uh, we're only producing a cask a day. Uh, to put that into context or scale, the majority of whiskey distilleries and Speyside and even Isla, uh, they're producing and laying down hundreds of casks per day. So completely kind of different scale. And because we're a bit smaller and there is spare capacity in the grid, uh, we've been able to go fully electric. And this electric steam boiler that we uh, purchased and installed at the back here is what produces the steam that kind of heats our all our production equipment, basically. We partnered with the University of Highlands and Islands to do a carbon study um, on how much carbon this would save. And um, if we use green electricity, uh, it'll save 160 tons of carbon per year. Um, so significant saving there for us to be made. So at the moment, we're just using grid electricity. Um, we've got ambitions to try and put some renewables in site, on site as well to try and bring down the energy cost because as well as a kind of higher capex cost of putting this equipment in, especially when you've got to put in a new substation or three phase, it gets very expensive. We've also got a higher OPEX cost, operational expenditure as well. So our unit energy cost compared to uh, the traditional route of putting in a kerosene boiler is you know, almost twice as high. So um, larger distilleries um, that operate on a different business model and that have much bigger scale, uh, they always go kerosene at the moment. Um, even new distilleries are still putting in kerosene boilers at the moment. So the kerosene boiler's got to 25 year shel uh, shelf life really, um, working life. So you know, it was, we've kind of found it difficult to justify putting that in at this stage uh, in the kind of um, green debate, really. So we chose to go uh, green in that respect. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and this is our uh, visitor centre again. This is us actually installing our equipment. So all the equipment got installed um, around kind of April, May time. And we had to open up a hole in the roof that you can see here. And all the washbacks, the fermenters, uh, and the mash tun and the hot water tank and everything else has already been installed, craned through the roof. And um, this is the stills um, that just arrived off a lorry uh, made in uh, Rothes in um, Scotland. And they all got craned through. And I talked about this building being quite small. Um, we've actually got the stills poking out the roof here. Uh, the building's so small. So quite an unusual feature to have stills poking out the roof. But it's actually from the... Um, Top of the still, swan neck going down the line arm and condensers. So that actually kind of helps our energy efficiency, interestingly, because um, it helps um, from that point on, we're actually trying to cool the vapor down and turn it into a liquid. Uh, so being outside kind of helps with the Hebridean uh, climate that we've got. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And this is um, some drawings for a malting shed that we've got in um, a planning application in for at the moment. That went in about um, nine months ago, 
it's just kind of slowly working its way through uh, the planning process. Um, so we've got field to bottle whiskey ambitions, um, which means that we grow our own barley, uh, we malt it on site, which makes it ready for use in a distillery. Uh, we distill on site, mature on site, and bottle on site. So there's less than um, uh, there's less than five field to bottle produce, whiskey producers in Scotland. So it's pretty uncommon. Every distillery would have done this back in the day, going back 100 years ago, um, but they were just much smaller in scale at that stage, so they could do this. Um, so we're kind of really hoping to take whiskey back to its roots. We're using this heritage barley variety called bear barley, which is the oldest grain in use in the British Isles, um, and it grows in um, bear is the only type of grain that grows in newest uh, barley variety due to the climate here. So we grew 20 acres of this bear barley um, this season. And we're hoping to build this molting plant uh, just subject to financing um, kind of spring next year and kind of start our field to bottle whiskey journey. We'll actually be the only field to we'll be able to utilize our electric steam boiler um, and use that um, same energy source uh, to uh, in our molting plant. And that'll make us the only um, carbon neutral field to bottle whiskey distillery in Scotland. So the whiskey industry's got like a target for being carbon neutral by 2040. Um, it's definitely not going to get there. <laughs> it's a long, long way to go, um, but we'll certainly get there. And we're hoping to be a bit of a kind of poster child for the industry to show that hey, if we can do it in a kind of um, um, poorly funded business, bootstrap business, then I don't see why the bigger people can't do it as well. So um, that's our kind of hopes and ambitions. Um, so I think that's me. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, please follow our journey. Uh, visit us if you're in US. We'd love to uh, stop in and say hi. Always kind of excited and keen to uh, talk about our kind of carbon footprint and our um, kind of uh, B Corp credentials as well. And um, yeah, thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Johnny. Fascinating story there. Um, if I can invite um, all our panelists to come back on screen. Um, and I'll just move on to the last slide. Um, we'll just have a, um, a bit of a discussion and take questions um, <coughs> from the chat. So as a reminder, if you're, if you're here in the, as audience members, please do post questions via the chat function and, uh, and then we'll, we'll come to those shortly. Um, first, just to take the opportunity to thank you all, um, a really varied um, a range of um, sort of topics and information presented there, Pilar, from the case studies um, and the support that's available um, you know, via a number of different um, channels there. Craig, um, you know, really good to have that overview um, of a direct electric um, heat and, and, and fantastic Flexel manufactured and based in Scotland. And I think in terms of our islands um, and, and, you know, green uh, grid uh, connections, you know, really good opportunity there to, you know, to look at alternatives to, to fossil fuel um, and uh, Johnny yeah really really comprehensive overview of, of the business um, um, absolutely um, um, all power to you there in terms of the overall messaging around the product but in particular the use of electricity um, as your heating um, maybe as a, a first question to yourself Johnny um, you mentioned in your introduction about using um, far infrared um, it, am I right then in thinking that that's your space heating? So in terms of the the, the shop, the visitors bit, you know, mm -hmm. staff accommodation, is, is that what's heating that then? That's correct. At the moment, we've got infrared heating in our um, visitor centre area. Our production area um, is going to be incredibly hot with all the stills running in the background. So we're probably going to be trying to cool that space down. We did look at kind of re uh, reusing some of the heat from the production area uh, into our visitor centre. But once you start, um, the costs involved of kind of engineering companies to, you know, kind of reuse heat um, from one space in the building to the other, kind of given the distances involved, it could be like 30 to 40 meters. It becomes like really restrictive. So stuff like the Business Energy Scotland support um, is really, really useful for stuff like that. You know, we've had a um, Business Energy Scotland survey done for our building to look at the kind of energy saving measures that we can put in from a more from a kind of like visitor center perspective and now we're looking at for our production area as well the lowest hanging fruit for us from a um, carbon saving is all to do with our um, production you know we're using a, a, a lot of electricity in that end of the building so even like a one percent saving there um, equates to 
clips as anything we could ever save in the visitor center. So we're really kind of dialing down and focusing on that area of the business at the moment. And presumably, um, you, you know, uh, are you using a green tariff then in terms of the electricity? Um, is that is that something you've been able to access? Um, exactly. So at the moment, uh, full disclaimer, at the moment, we're just going to be using, um, we signed up for one year just on a regular uh, tariff, which my understanding is got about 40% green electricity. I also understand um, um, that I think all the electricity that's used in US is roughly green anyway because of the uh, wind turbines that are all, um, used uh, locally, but we're not actually paying for green electricity yet. That's something that we're going to start doing when this first year's tariff runs out, basically. In the meantime, we're looking to try and establish some more renewables on site as well. Due to the kind of amount of electricity we use, um, yeah, any kind of saving that we can make there with regards to electricity is um, pretty, pretty uh, profound for the business. Yeah, I think I think no one would fault you that, given the level of investment that's clearly been had to make. Um, I mean, a, a new substation and a new, you know, three-phase connection there is is not insubstantial. And um, that maybe nicely leads on to a question for Craig. Um, I guess it's an issue across all direct electric heating, um, and, but particularly in island communities where um, you know sometimes uh, there are more frequency of power cuts um, than. Than maybe in the central belt of Scotland, and um, just you know, in terms of that resilience of an electric only system, and, and Johnny, um, you might have thoughts, I guess, on this as well. Um, you know, a battery is part of the mix there. Um, or what, what, what's the Craig? What's in your experience? Have you found people, um, you know, having to have other systems as well, or, or yeah, if you can comment on that? Absolutely. Um, solar and battery, very much renewables of the day uh, at the moment. Uh, and yes, our systems work with both. Um, you can either have uh, feed-in from um, TV solar on its own, which obviously during the day most people don't want their heating on anyway, unless it's in the winter time. But with battery storage, uh, it's certainly an option to, to add to uh, the mix, and uh, our, our solutions work off a of battery. Solution's not a problem at all. We actually, as a company, have, I mentioned the 10 companies that we, we own now, one of them is actually a three-phase battery manufacturer based in the Czech Republic. Um, unfortunately, in the UK, we haven't really pushed that to the extreme, uh, and unfortunately, the market's flooded with batteries from the Far East. So we don't really see the market for it, but for us, then we can provide that solution in a three-phase situation. They're more designed for batteries in industrial commercial premises rather than domestic locations, which, of course, in the UK, not many are three phase at the moment, although that's uh, future future proofing the house is to have three phase and new builds. So yes, definitely the mixture. Unfortunately, we're not classed as renewable energy, uh, renewables in, in the energy mix, um, but certainly in terms of infrared heating versus ele direct electric heating, our, our solution uh, saves much more energy than a traditional convection heater, maybe a two kilowatt heater sitting in the corner of your office. We all remember those days. But yes, they're, they're pre-designed to mix in with the batteries and the solar to save further energy, particularly where power out, outage is an issue. Okay, thanks, Craig and Johnny. Do you want to come in on, I guess, that you know grid um, issues there? Yeah, we haven't chosen to put any battery storage in site to do with the visitor center for maintaining heating over winter. Um, we're generally footfall in the islands is pretty low over winter, so there has been actually been one or two days when we've had power out for the whole day and I mean that kind of shuts basically shuts down the whole visitor center and we just kind of work from home that day it does get very cold when you don't have the um, space heaters on the infrared heaters um, so it is a little bit of an issue but power cuts in the Hebrides are nothing like what they used to be the kind of a resilience of the network is so much uh, greater now than compared to what it used to be I've got a, um, a air source a uh, heat pump at home for our house as well, but I think in modern houses you just retain so much heat. It's amazing, even just the solar gain you get in a modern house if you've got lots of glass. Um, you know that you can kind of get by for the odd power cut, really. <clears throat> that's, that's good to hear. But presumably, um, if there was a power cut, production would would production stop then with the steam? Um, exactly. Yeah, if we got power cut, we're going to have to stop production, and there's no battery storage that we could get that would be able to kind of fuel our production with the amount of electricity we use so yeah it's just comes with the territory <laughs> yeah or well, maybe a maybe a conversation offline with craig there if they've got three phase battery but it's, uh, yep. that's interesting to hear and uh peel assembly yep. around um battery you know if we're looking at direct electric um any any 
particular parts of the support landscape or install information around um, that side of things? Um, there was a change on, uh, I think it was before June, if I remember well, early June. Um, the Homer's is called and Grand and Lawn was supporting the, um, was funding the installation of uh, batteries and PV when it was uh, combined with a heat pump. But the Scottish government changed the the rule from early June, and there is no funding uh, going into the installation of battery or or PV at the moment. The decision at the time was to focus the budget available on decarbonizing heat because um, those um, systems were taking quite a lot of the, the budget so, and it's a limited budget and Scottish Government decided that the focus was on removing uh, combustion boilers and getting heat pumps and other clean heating systems. Uh, Craig, um, uh, infrared is not considered renewable but it is a clean heating system. Anything yeah. we are electrifying the the grid and that's an, another option. There is no funding at the moment for uh, infrared through the Homer's Use Coal and Grand and Loan, but if I'm not wrong, it might be there is an option under the Business Energy Scotland, uh, probably for businesses because this infrared is something that is commonly used in premises to, mm -hmm. to um, heat the people rather than, than the big spaces. Yeah. Um, I do have a question for Craig, if that's okay. Absolutely, yeah. go for it. Um, Craig, um, with your systems, uh, what sort of uh, qualifications or requirements the installers had to install those? Because obviously with heat pumps, we have the challenge of the heat loss and how important is the design and, and the heat loss and the sizing the heat pump correctly. What is the situation for um, uh, infrared and who would it be a electrician the one that is installing those products just a little bit of insights there on yeah yeah so um unfortunately for the air source heat pump market obviously we're heading towards technicians which are a mixture of a uh, plumbing training and also electrical training so there's a a, a new <laughs> if you like career being created there and the training is required for that some plumbers are moving into air source heat pumps, some electricians are moving into air source heat pumps, and uh, the technician has really been formed, uh, which requires training. And that's that's the issue for air source heat pumps, in my opinion, is obviously the 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 number of people that are actually fully qualified to install air source heat pumps and maintain them going forward. With infrared, our installers are electricians. It's as simple as that. It's a plug and play system. It can be very simple to putting it to a plug, which we don't recommend. But um, uh, normally we go through a thermostat control to to, um, to manage the heating solution. But in some cases where it's big, massive warehouse spaces, we'd actually look at uh, spot heating with push button timers, for example, as being the control system. But any qualified electrician, and the qualified electrician, in inverted commas, is a real difficulty for Select, who are the, the association that look after electricians in Scotland, because at the moment there's no there is qualifications to be an electrician, but there's nothing to stop somebody advertising themselves as an electrician when they're not fully trained. So fully accredited electricians can install their products, of which there's tens of thousands in Scotland that can do that product. So the, the uh, training element has already been covered, really. We also offer online training as well as um, telephone talks about installations, etc. being a business that's in this uh, field. So it's really just electricians can install any of our products at all, um, which are, we recommend fully trained electricians do that. Even that includes under floor heating cable stuff, which a lot of people are now using plumbers, uh, tilers, flooring showrooms, DIYers are having a go installing, but we thoroughly recommend it's an electrician that installs these products that they manufacture. Craig, Thank thanks you. for that update Thank and you. question there, Peter. Um, I'm keen to bring Keith in. Um, I know he's got something he wants to add to this and uh, I think has to drop off before the very end of this call. So, Keith, uh, the floor's yours. 
Yeah, thanks, Tom. And I uh, yeah, really enjoyed the, the conversation this morning. Really inspiring to hear um, from, from yourself, Johnny, Craig and Pilar. I think it, it, it reinforces how much good work and what the art of the possible is across the heat agenda and, and you know, places that are traditionally fairly hard to treat in terms of heat decarbonisation. But I did just want to flag and a bit of a shameless plug before I drop off uh, for, to, to present another webinar. Um, HIE is launching today uh, its new round of green grant funding to assist businesses and community groups with their um, decarbonisation agenda and, and, and the pathway to get towards net zero carbon across scope one, scope two and scope three emissions. So we can actually plug some of those gaps that Pilar highlighted in terms of looking at decarbonisation of heat through solar battery, air source heat pumps, etc. So what I would encourage those on the call today um, and, and for you to share within your wider networks is um, that this fund is now open and it will be a multi-year funding programme. Um, so a really good opportunity to get some support and to yeah, uh, shift away from fossil fuels to the likes of the technologies we've discussed today. But yeah, apologies, I will have to go, Tom, uh, but really enjoyed the, the conversation this morning and hope the rest of the session goes well. Thank you, Keith. And we'll make sure that the link to that fund is shared um, with all the, all the attendees uh, as long as long, along with rather um, the slides as well. So if anyone wants to refer back to any of the images or the products or um, lots of the resources that Peelers shared links to, um, that will be available to all. Um, Johnny, a, a question um, uh, about obviously the, the challenge of working within a listed building uh, and a very beautiful one at that. Um, I appreciate within the the kind of production spaces, you, you sounds like you're trying to lose heat. Um, so probably there wasn't insulation and things done in those spaces, but to the visitor centre and maybe some of the others. Um, to what extent you have you been able to, or, or yeah, kind of retrofitted or made energy efficiency measures to those spaces? Yeah, so we were very fortunate with this building. It was um, fallen into a state of disrepair uh, by the late 90s. Um, you know hardly any roof left in it, no running water, electricity, windows, doors, and a trust was formed and renovated the building to, you know, the standards of the time, and this is in 1998, so it's actually got, uh, it's a stone building with thick walls, but there's actually a layer of uh, insulation um, within the building, so uh, during the Business Energy Scotland kind of, we still got the original architectural plans for that, so we passed everything on to Business Energy Scotland, who prepared the um, report on where we could make carbon savings and that's been really useful actually so we had a relatively good starting point and uh, that was renovated in 1998. <clears throat> that's, that's great, it's really interesting to hear. Um, well I'll, I'll just uh, thank everyone again and thank our audience for the questions and, and staying with us uh, till the end of the webinar. Um, as I say, this is the, the last in our series of Heat in the Highlands and Islands webinars with Highlands Islands Enterprise. Um, the recordings of these um, and the presentations will all be um, available after this um, in due course via the Heat Source website. Um, so if you've missed anything, there'll be an opportunity to, to catch up then. Um, if anyone um, hasn't been in touch with us around Heat Source, please get in touch via the website, um, Heat Source. Um, and uh, yeah, just thank our speakers again for their time, uh, both in preparing their presentations and, and so eloquently explaining, um, you know, the different roles in, in those uh, activities. Um, so, and uh, I'll just um, draw draw today's webinar to a close and thank everyone again. Thanks for having us.